Hey there, Booty! Welcome back to my channel and welcome to the next video in the series where we discuss the books that have won the Man Booker Prize in its history. We are now up to the 1974 co-winner, Holiday by Stanley Milliton. This novel shared the prize with Nadine Gordimer in the year in which it won. And the novel opens with this paragraph. Light shimmered along the polished pews as the congregation heaved itself to its feet, hailing the Lord's anointed. Grain arrows waved darkly in the wood under the coating of shellac, the brightness of elbow grease. Brass umbrella holders gleamed, but the metal rectangle to house the name of the pew's occupier had been allowed to blacken in disuse. While the observation of a church setting seems like the beginning of a religious novel, it is indeed a story about observation itself. And in this book, Stanley Middleton presents a main character named Edwin Fisher. He's a 32-year-old college lecturer who returns to the seaside destination where he vacationed with his parents when he was just a boy, seeking connections with strangers and making observations that he hopes will be sublime enough to displace the dissociation he feels in his life now that his infant son has died and his marriage to his wife, Meg, seems to have reached its natural conclusion. And over the course of 240 pages, Edwin Fisher begins these casual dalliances with guests that he meets at the local bed and breakfast that he is staying at in a very working class neighborhood, even though his college professorship means that he should be able to afford something a little bit better. But he seems to be seeking that domestic scene, which is now absent now that his family life has broken up. He also takes up a position on the seaside, sitting in a chair, not unlike this one, sitting in his suit and tie, watching young women sun themselves on the beach and seeking out relationships with them, all the while he's being pursued by his father-in-law, Vernon, who is a solicitor or a a lawyer, negotiator, if you will, who is trying to broker an agreement to have Meg and Edwin recommit themselves to their marriage and to each other. Although this young main character, Edwin Fisher, is supposed to be mourning the loss of his young son, the author doesn't really introduce the details of his loss until very late in the novel. On page 18, I think it is, we know that his son has died. But it isn't until page 82 where we know how old his son was when he died and not for another 100 pages when it is revealed the circumstances under which his son died and why maybe we should feel really sorry for Edwin. And so it seems like the author chooses to be deliberately obscure, concealing the real motive behind Edwin's actions as though opening up said actions for judgment in a way in which the reader might have been a little bit more empathetic if we had known the real reason for Edwin's loss and his marauding around the seaside town, interfering in people's relationships, interfering in their marriages in a way that seems to be characteristic of him, but not quite if you know why he is acting the way he is. Holiday seems to be a very paradoxical kind of novel where the author offers us various examples of each type of relationship and almost invites the reader to compare and contrast them. So he gives us several examples of parent-child relationships and with each one, a different kind of parenting style. And through a series of flashbacks and recollections, we're able to see how each parenting style affected the child as they grew up and what kind of characteristics are produced by the parents themselves. He also gives us examples of various kinds of marriages and shows us how people behave in relationships, some of the things that they're looking for and whether those are goals that they can actually achieve. The fact that this novel begins well, not the novel so much, but the encounter between Edwin and his wife began in the playhouse where they were there to watch Ibsen's A Doll's House. It ties in with the themes that that play explores as well, which, if you're not familiar, A Doll's House is about a married woman seeking self-fulfillment, but not really being able to do so because of the male-dominated society in which she lives. And that is definitely something that is explored here in both of those two kinds of paradoxical relationships that the author seems to focus on. Meg, the absentee wife, Edwin Fisher's spouse, even though she's absent for most of this novel because it follows Edwin himself, she's very much present in the fact that she's talked about and her father is physically present representing her interest. So we do get a study of her, but we're also able to see 
through his representation, how Meg was raised, and through Edwin's experience, how Meg turned out. And so this novel, through a very strange method, seems to explore how children are raised and what kind of results you can expect when they become adults. But it's all seen through third party eyes. And so we have Edwin reeling from the disaster that is his marriage, but also reflecting on how it began and what he did, what he contributed towards its demise. Fascinating, but that's only one aspect. We also see Edward's view of his own childhood, his own experience being raised by his parents who were workaholic shopkeepers who sacrificed everything to make sure that their children had a top class education. So Edwin himself becomes a college professor, college lecturer, and his sister becomes a doctor who's married to a doctor, which seems to be the ultimate mark of success for parents who have sacrificed for their children's education. But the tragedy is that Edwin's parents both died before they were able to really enjoy the fruits of their labor. So while they were children and the parents were scrimping and saving to ensure a good future, the limits of their vacation was to spend a week in this seaside town that Edwin Fisher has returned to. But while he goes there seeking some kind of memory, his experience as a child is juxtaposed with his own adult choices and so, we see him now as an adult. We see him remembering how he sacrificed time with his family for his professional duties. And we also see him wandering around this town, trying to reclaim things that have been lost and he can no longer regain, but also in some kind of a period of self-flagellation because he has done almost the same thing that his parents did and castigating himself for not having learned from the mistakes of his father because now he has also lost the opportunity to spend time with his son because his son has died. Additionally, we have all these marriages on display and we do get some insight as each one of the individuals weighs in on what commitment is like in general, but also discussing their own specific marriage and how they feel about their partners and about being married in general. And that of course comes to a head when Fisher reminds himself and tells the reader about how he and Meg met in the first place because while she was flirting with him in the lobby as they waited for the intermission of Ibsen's doll's house and of course what that means to the story while she's flirting with Edwin Fisher she is at that time on a date with a man who's later revealed to be her fiance we also get discussions from the conversations that Edwin has with the couples that he meets at the bed and breakfast and with women that he meets on the beach, all of whom are in what seem to be committed relationships, but all these women seem to encourage these dalliances with Edwin Fisher. And we get conversations and physical interactions that lead into this will they, won't they discussion about swinging and wife swapping. And it seems as though all these men are open to the idea of open relationships and free love, which I suppose might have been par for the course during the 1970s in which this book was written. But underlying all of those personal issues, we also have a quiet political undercurrent because on this seaside holiday strip, we have these vacationers, some of who are middle-class people who are not able to afford overseas vacations but we also have people who are more wealthy and who could afford to go abroad but have chosen to stay local who've chosen to stay in this local bed and breakfast and holiday not too far from home and indeed by their own actions expressing disdain for people who would venture to other shores and this seemed to be almost some political statement and these characters seem to be expressing this isolationist attitude that may have still been rampant at the time because of these countries and these people's experience of becoming embroiled in foreign wars that had almost little or no benefit to them personally. The novel itself is not stylistically complex and yet it is an unusual read just because of the shades in which the scenes move from present reality to memory and the past and often only returning to the first when one is interrupted almost mimicking the way a human would observe the world seeing something and being drawn into a memory of what it what it reminds the observer of 
and only returning when one is physically interrupted by something else happening in the present and that is definitely reflected in the changing scenes that are presented here in this novel most of it happens over the course of a week most of it happens in the mind of the main character as he goes around this town and meets characters and has interactions with them but he's always reflecting on what has happened in the past what has led him to this place and making comparisons between the two. In the background of this novel, the author also includes a refrain from Bach opuses and Beethoven and Rachmaninoff's concertos. Music that I'm sure if I understood the analogy, it would add another even layered, more complex dimension to this novel. But I haven't quite made the comparison between what the music means to Ibsen's play A Doll's House and Stanley Militant's Holiday. So if you've read this one and you've made the analogy, you've grasped the allegory for the comparison between the music and the play and this novel, then I'd love to hear from you in the comments down below. I'd also like to talk with you if you've read this book for any reason or if hearing me talk about it today makes you more inclined to pick it up. Like I said, this is the 1974 co-winner for the Man Booker Prize. Stanley Milliton shared the prize with Nadine Gordimer that year for her novel, which was set in South Africa called The Conservationist. And while both books seem to be very different in that this doesn't make the widely acclaimed political statement that Nadine Gordimer made in her novel, this does have its own brilliance because of what it says about human characteristics and human tendencies and how how our actions lead to natural conclusions. And of course, the discussion of gender inequality and the natural result of our actions and what they produce in the future, while they may seem to be not quite as political as a book about apartheid and the long lasting effects of race relations in South Africa, both of those two themes seem to be as poignant as each other and so I think I agree with the fact that both of these books were awarded the prize in that same year. So Stanley Milliton's Holiday 1974 Man Booker Prize winner. This is the most recent book that I have reviewed for my Man Booker Reading Challenge. I'm trying to read all the books that have won the prize in its history during this calendar year. Look out for my next video in this series where I'll be reviewing the 1975 winner Heat and Dust by Ruth Prower Javala that is set in India. And I hope I'll see you for that next video. If you haven't already subscribed to this channel, subscribe to the playlist as well so you'll be notified when I post the next video in this series. Give me a thumbs up if you like this video and let's talk in the comments. I'd love to hear from you and until next time, happy reading. Bye!